I have the same background with you and from mathematics department. So, uh, but uh, in the last uh, few years, I uh, we have a cooperation with the uh, uh, CRE Paris. Maybe you have ever heard Center of uh, Interdisciplinary Research in Paris. Yes, it's about uh, also it's about learning science. Actually, UKM is also involved in the this is UNESCO project about learning science. One of the topics is about the teaching through research. So your your talk actually is really match with my interest also. Uh, one of the interests in the undergrad in the in the level of master and PhD, it's very easy to do with the student uh, student engagement especially because uh, it's research based but in the undergraduate it's a little bit tricky especially with, uh, in my experience the student engagement is uh, the student the student only copy what the teacher say the student only copy what the teacher has done the research so uh, that is uh, not really the point is so the point is how to get really the students involved and to get the idea they do it themselves the research and this is not easy. That's uh, it's also our uh, challenge in here. So what is your experience about that? Thank you. Thank you. Another, another question. Um, so um, for any one of these things, it might seem kind of easy to do them. You know, oh, you know, have students interact with one another. They like to interact with one another. Uh, but if you think about this, the student engagement as a whole, but the idea that we want all, all of our students very engaged in their learning process. For most universities uh, in the U.S., for most, I think, around the world, uh, we are very used to a mode of instruction that is about the lecturer talking and the student receiving the information and then having to reproduce that information somewhere else. And, and student engagement, like a few other things, is trying to disrupt that notion. And disrupting it is really disrupting culture and trying to move the culture of an institution or a department or something in another direction. And as we all know, changing one's culture is a challenge. People don't like to let go of the things that they've done in the past. But my understanding is problem-based learning has been implemented uh, in, in, at OGM in, this, in, in the Faculty of Medicine. And I imagine getting it started was not easy. <laughs> and that there were some challenges and it, it took some change in the culture of the School of Medicine. And, and it's that kind of work that's required in the shift in, in, in trying to understand. And I think uh, lectures and, and professors um, often uh, in order, if they're going to change, they need to know why, and they need to know it's why, how it's going to be better than what they've been doing before. Um, and so, providing evidence, providing incentive, and then students will react differently. <laughs> some students will love the change, uh, and some students will not like it because it's different. They're, used, they're very used to what we ask them to do. Um, so, so that's part of what I think about when I think about these types of changes. Um, another thing is um, I think we often, uh, as lecturers and instructors, have some responsibility to send more consistent messages to our students about what we expect them to do. So if we ask lecturers and, and professors, you know, do you want your students to think complexly? about the issues that we're teaching, even at the undergraduate level, they'll say, yes, we do. Uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to teach. But then if you look at the assignments and the exams that we give, they oftentimes don't ask for very complicated thinking. They ask for memorization. And so we're saying we want one thing, but then we're asking our students to produce another. And students, <laughs> Students care less about what we say and more about what we ask them to do. And so, we can say we want complex thinking, but until we're asking them to really do it, involving them in experiences, 
where they'll be required to use more complicated thinking and where we're showing them how we are comp more complicated thinkers then they don't uh, if we don't do those things they don't have any incentive to do that so i that's not a complete answer <laughs> but those are things that i think about when i think think about those that challenging question In general, so um, I think this list is something for uh, someone to think about. Usually, usually, when when a, a faculty or um, a, a, a university um, thinks about these indicators and and measures what's happening, usually they're doing some of these things well already, um, and so I wouldn't think about. Um, Sort of making, uh, you know, doing all of them. I would think about where, which, which ones are the ones that we want or need to improve. Um, and so, if I would think about, you know, picking some three, maybe four, maybe five of these areas, and think think about um, where where you could improve particular indicators. Um, it's very hard to do all of this at once. Um, you can eventually get there, but uh, it, it helps to um, start with a, a few of the indicators and make improvements there and then uh, sort of go back and see if where you need to make more improvements. Also with the high impact practices uh, list, um, though some of those activities are more appropriate for some faculties than others. So um, you, want, you don't necessarily want to do them all. It's more important that student, students have some exposure to some of the list. So for example, you'll see um, uh, research uh, with uh, professors uh, is something that about 20% of undergraduates in the US do. So, and I don't know that m maybe more of them will do it in the future, but it will never be 100% across all of the faculties, all of the institutions. Um, it'll, it'll be a smaller proportion. So pick a few things of the indicators, maybe one or two from each theme. Make improvement there. Once you've done that, you can uh, make improvements elsewhere. The other thing to point out is oftentimes when we make an improvement in one area, it ends up helping other areas. So. If we promote more collaborative learning, um, we sometimes will increase the amount of student professor interaction as well. But, but uh, which indicators uh, you think the most important one? Which, <laughs> if you, if you choose, uh, in your experience. In your experience. <laughs> yes, um, it, that's that's uh, context. It depends on the institution or the faculty or the department that we're talking about. Um, so, uh, so that's a, a little bit of a cop out of answering your question. I, I didn't, I don't answer it directly. Um, but things that, um, it, well, if I were going to say um, more important things, I think from my own perspective, uh, the peer interaction, working with other students to help uh, do things is very important. Um, reflective and integrative learning. Uh, our research and the research of some other people show that, that that leads to a lot of outcomes. The more you do that, the, m the more improvement you get on a number of different outcomes. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, and I think student-faculty interaction, student-professor interaction. If I was going to pick out three, uh, I would do that. But 
it's hard to I mean campus environment people need to feel like they're supported so <laughs> it, it's a challenge to pick out just just those that's why examining the context finding out what you're doing well and then looking at places that need improvement that helps sort of guide the selection was uh, the way you evaluate the students engagement I believe that in our faculty of medicine here actually students are heavily involved in the activities with the faculty and uh, so far what I, I saw was that our indicator is the outcome indicators how many paperwork something like that so your presentation provide us with the ideas how to evaluate the strengths and the weaknesses of the system so that we can pinpoint on what the weakness so far we uh, we, we, we try to improve to involve students and more and more and more but this is something systematic approach from you so I thank you so much perhaps we can develop it in more more uh, systematic in our faculty yeah thank you very much you're very welcome. Uh, just a comment. Um, one of the things, it, it's interesting when we talk about outcomes, we can, you know, if, if we want people to write more and produce papers or to, um, you know, be able to think more complexly. You can, you can evaluate those things and find out that you're doing well or you're not doing as well as you want to do. And you, whenever you do that, you get to the question, well, how, how do we fix the problems that we have? And that's one of the powerful things about student engagement as an idea and about assessing it as a process is that it, it helps provide the answers to improving the outcomes that you want. Um, instead of just knowing that you're not doing what you want to do very well, you know, you, use, you can use these experiences to help promote the outcomes. So um, it's, it's important, we believe it's important. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, in my opinion, I saw your uh, classification of indicators over there. Most of them are quantitative one. But, based on my experience as well as student, <laughs> okay, most of my peers, their motivation to engage in discussion or something uh, it's based on their values. Why I study? Some of my students, they're already professionals in class. They might think the script as what the teacher says. Only to improve it, only to make some emotions. Um, but at the end, it's, some of them say, at the end, we will work at the office and we Ready for everything. Just do it for the teachers and finish it and get this course. And on the other hand, uh, there, there is also a student which, ex, uh, which is the excellent course. You want some challenging. Um, if you give the A standard, they will try to make a better standard. So, based on their motives, is it like do you have like different approach for them to push their student education as Thank you for the question. Um, uh, yes, you need different approaches with students with different motivations. Um, and uh, some, I, I think uh, the first question based on that is, why do students have the motivations that they have, that they bring to their undergraduate studies? And in the US, we have a problem with this right now. We have been in a shift uh, over the last 50 years 
for students believing that college, the purpose of college is for them to be able to get a job. And college does play that role in part, but that's the main thing that they're bringing to it. And, and some of what we're talking about are things, activities that, they'll, that, that they should get involved with, not necessarily to get a job, but to be a better person be able to think better, to be able to be a better member of their community, to be a better family member. Um, they need to learn about themselves and learn about others. And, and so some of it is about getting students to think about their motivations and whether they, have, whether they actually have other ones. Because if I'm here to get a job and a professor is asking me to spend a lot of time with my peers, and I don't think those peers are going to help me get a job. What's my motivation for putting a lot of effort in or doing other things? So they need, a, they need some help understanding why this is an important activity for them. And some of that is about changing their motivation. But also, sometimes we can trick our students. Trick, uh, maybe trick them. But taking, interacting with their peers, sometimes students don't understand that their future employers want these types, they want them to practice these types of things. Uh, having a job isn't just about showing up, it's about being able to do the work, being able to do the work well, being able to work with other people. And so a lot of the engagement we do as students is practice for the engagement that we need to do as employees, as family members, as community members, as citizens. And so helping them see that, helping them see the activities in a different light, um, and then also sometimes just, uh, you know, if they want to get a better job, you know, you can use that motivation sometimes to say, well, employers like this, <laughs> so you want to do it, and maybe as they go through the experience, help sh shape and reshape their motivation realize that it's also about community, it's also about businesses. Okay, so before we start the second session, I have one uh, big question for uh, so you. <coughs> if you do this uh, student engagement, then you can, uh, or a uh, faculty or uh, a school can differentiate uh, which of the students uh, can have more a brilliant, more active, more maybe uh, in terms of future care, much better than is, is that right? So this kind of things, engagement uh, processes, will classify students into some classes, active and passive? Uh, yes, sometimes, although it's not, it's not perfect. <laughs> it, it's not easy, but yes, some, there, there are groups of students who are highly engaged, there are groups of students who are engaged a little bit in certain activities, and then there are students who are not very engaged at all. And so you, they kind of group, and those groups tend to um, be related to performance, how well they're doing in the school. Is that yeah. what we were asking? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and in a way, um, it would be nice to be able to, on the admissions side, on the, on the beginning of college, be able to uh, say something about, you know, bringing students in who we know are going to be engaged. That would be good. Um, on the other hand, and encouraging engagement and, that, and letting students know what the expectations are uh, at that very beginning. On the other hand, I think the last question was sort of also, how do we, when we identify students who aren't engaged, what are the things that we can do to encourage that? But, I also think this is really uh, complicated. I, students don't always know the, the power that they have in the sort of teaching and learning experience, but I always, I, I get reminded every once in a while, I can't make students do this good stuff. I, you know, I can't grab their hands and, and do it. They have, they have to take some things. So there are some students who will say no. They, they won't get involved in these things. And I, as a professor, I have to learn to understand that, try to keep 
engaging, attracting, motivating them, pushing them to understand why, but they have the power to say no. That, will, they, that may affect their ability to stay uh, at university, but but they have some power to decide. They need, they need to decide that they're going to be engaged. So, which is a challenge. I, I sort of want to make them. <laughs> so some of the activities is not compulsory for all students. Right? You, it, you can't, some of these things you can't make them do. Okay, so it's free to do the to join the game school. Yes, so. But that means we have to offer it. Yes, and you have to try to make it attractive. It's more than what an active, an active program. Uh, both, I mean. We can require some things, we can, um, but we can't, it's hard to require all of this, or uh, certainly all of it in all experiences. So, it's like, uh, it's also I mean, given some motivation, you know, we can require our students to come to office hours. <laughs> some students do, but they, they just come to get the check mark to say that they came to see the faculty, or they're not actually getting anything out of the experience. So even if we require some aspects of this, it doesn't mean they'll be truly engaged in it. Sorry, I think I'll get at this point. Uh, do you have any evaluation which shows that I understood the patient actually is better outcomes? Yes. So it? There's, I didn't present it here today, but there's a body of research that shows that Student-faculty interaction leads to a, a lot of, of different outcomes um, that are important. More, their students who interact with their professors are more likely to stay at university, finish. Uh, they're more likely to uh, view themselves well, have more confidence, um, and get better grades and other things. Um, the first two indicators listed: higher learning and reflective and integrated learning are ways of measuring what we call deep approaches to learning. So not surface level memorization type learning, but deeper uh, learning. That's been shown to be connected to more complex thinking. Uh, also staying, continuing your studies and other things. So each one of these activities, there's a research base that shows that it's connected to outcomes that professors want their students to have and that institutions want their students to have. And during those evaluation, So uh, the one thing that we have not talked about um, is, uh, so each one of, well, most of these can be done well or not implemented well or not implemented well. And so I think the, that when these activities are implemented well, they, they have positive uh, outcomes. Sometimes when they're not implemented well, they either have no effect or um, or they may even have negative effects. So it, it's possible that through some of these activities, if the quality of the experience is poor, uh, it, can, it, can be, it can be a problem, problem for students. The other thing I would say is just um, there's a time, right? Time is not an infinite resource. And so it's, it, there are questions about how much, you know, where does where where do the benefits start to diminish for students? You know, um, that the, the sort of benefit of student engagement might eventually level off, and they don't need to be more and more and more uh, engaged. We talk about time. Is, uh, are there resources also for patients? They don't make some engagement. <laughs> yeah. Time. Time. Um, well, yes. This is one of the things that we we talk about uh, quite a bit, especially high impact practices. Sometimes institutions have to invest resources, money, staff time, um, equipment, other things. And um, for the most part, uh, what we can learn is uh, most of these activities don't take a tremendous amount of extra investment. Usually, universities have already made the investment in the types of things that are needed. Um, so it's, it mostly is a time. Uh, Thing, but there are other resources, and institutions as they get into this should be aware of it. It's not just, you know, they should be thinking about that 
how much they're putting in and what they're taking out, and, and assessing and evaluating whether it's being as effective as they hoped. Um, because we certainly would, we don't encourage everybody just to throw as many resources at this as possible and do that wisely. Uh, it's better to, to, to take advantage of what was already there, not to overinvest, but to invest in smart ways. Um, and uh, what we find in the U.S. is uh, a benefit keeping students in university and on time, on, you know, finishing in four years, helps save a lot of resources in the system. And so anything that's invested that helps improve uh, time to degree and other, other ideas is a, is a big benefit. And some of us have that benefit.